So what does bias mean? The design of a statistical study shows bias if it would consistently underestimate or consistently overestimate the value you want to know. Uh, for example, I want to estimate the average height of an adult male, and I collect data from a basketball team, right? Now, that's a silly example. No one would really do that, but it's an exaggerated example to show you the effects of bias. If I only collected data from the basketball team, I would be consistently overestimating the parameter that I'm trying to capture, which is the mean adult height. So that would not be a good way to do it. Okay, now, bias is not to be confused with something called sampling error. When I take a random sample, samples do vary. If I take a random sample and you take a random sample, they're gonna vary, they're gonna differ, and that difference is called sampling error. Error here doesn't mean that you made a mistake. It just means the variations in different samples. So if I take one sample, uh, it's highly, highly unlikely that my sample's going to consist of only basketball players, but it's possible. If I randomly select 10 people out of the population, I could, due to chance alone, get 10 basketball players and overestimate the adult male height average. Um, but if you took a sample of 10 people, it's not likely that, first, it's not likely that I would get all 10 basketball players, but it's even less likely, almost zero, that we would both get um, 10 basketball players in our samples. And so thus, we're not systematically overestimating the parameter um, because it's not built into the system. If I built into the system, I'm going to go to a basketball court and measure everybody's height, then that is bias, okay? So sometimes, uh, data can overestimate or underestimate a parameter just by chance alone. That's called sampling error. Bias is when it's built into the system of sampling, okay? So here's the, here's some forms of bias that might appear in surveys and samples. The first one is called under coverage. Sounds like a spy, right? He's gone under coverage. Under coverage occurs when some members of the population cannot be chosen in a sample. So when your sampling method leaves out portions of the population. Okay, so for example, um, I want to collect data on global warming and I send out a Facebook message. Respond to this if you believe in global warming, okay? Or respond to this survey about whether or not you believe in global warming. Um, I'm leaving out the members of the population that don't have Facebook or are not on Facebook, right? So that would be an example of under coverage. That would also be an example of voluntary response, by the way, if I'm asking them for their feedback. So that's got two types of bias. But under coverage would be you post a question on a platform that not everybody has, so you're not collecting data from certain members of the population, so your sample would not represent the entire population. It would really only represent that smaller group that uses Facebook, okay? The second type is non-response bias. Okay, non-response bias occurs when an individual chosen for the sample can't be contacted or refuses to participate. So this is where you have some random method where you select individuals to be in your sample, and for some reason they either choose not to respond or you cannot get in touch with them, all right? That's called non-response bias. So a study would suffer from non-response bias if you're unable to reach a person that's selected. A third important type of bias is response bias. So there's non-response when someone doesn't respond. Response bias is a systematic pattern of incorrect responses or lies in a survey. So if somebody's just not telling the truth, maybe they're telling you what they think you want to hear as the researcher or what would make them look best uh, to give an answer, but it's not really the truth, that's response bias. Um, or maybe they misinterpret the question, they don't understand the question, and so they're giving you a, uh, an incorrect response that kind of uh, messes with the results, right? So that would be response bias, where someone does respond, but it's either untruthful or incorrect. An element that's very important in a study, especially a survey, is the wording of the question. It's the most important influence on the answers given to a survey. So you want to be careful. So I can word a question where I can get a response uh, that's favorable to me. For example, I can say, do you believe cell phones cause cancer? Now that's me just asking a question. I'm, the way I worded that was purposefully trying not to elicit a certain response, but let's say I chose to word it this way. 
A leading researcher at Harvard Medical School has found a link between cell phones and cancer. Do you agree? I'm basically asking the same question, but by asking you if you agree with a leading medical researcher at Harvard, I'm putting you in a position where you're more likely to say, yes, of course I agree. I'm not an expert, but this guy is. So um, the way I worded the question can elicit a completely different response than if I gave an unbiased wording of the question. So what can a researcher do to avoid bias or reduce the effects of bias when selecting a sample? Did you say randomization? Right. Randomness is our best defense against bias. So random sampling allows us to generalize our results to an appropriate population. And random assignment in an experiment allows us to infer causation if the results are statistically significant. So you want to use random sampling when you're collecting members of a sample and you want to use random assignment within an experiment so that you can infer cause and effect. Okay, so let's talk about sampling. Here are some common sampling methods. I'm going to start with the bad ones. The first is convenience sampling. Convenience sampling is when you choose individuals that are easiest to reach. This will typically result in a biased sample of like-minded individuals. A more specific type of convenience sampling is voluntary response sample. This is a sample that consists of individuals who choose themselves to be included in a study by volunteering. So if I look at the bottom of my receipt and it says, call this number to be entered into a drawing for a free gift card if you leave some feedback on your experience at our store or restaurant, right? That's voluntary response. Or stay on the line for a quick survey about your service. That's voluntary response. You're not being forced or you're not really being chosen. You're choosing yourself to participate. Now, what's wrong with this? Why does this introduce bias? Well, because it tends to be the case that individuals with strong opinions and usually in the same direction will voluntarily respond to a survey. So if you get really, really crummy service, you're more likely to voice your opinion than if your service is satisfactory or just mediocre. Okay, so what are some good ways to sample? Well, the best in most cases is a simple random sample, SRS. A simple random sample. First of all, we call it random because every member of the population is equally likely to be chosen for the sample. That's why that reduces bias. Why is it called a simple random sample? It's called a simple random sample because every grouping of individuals is possible. All right. If I added a stage to the sampling method here and make it more complex, I may not allow every combination of people to be chosen. All right. So a simple random sample usually takes place like this. You obtain a list of members from the population, you assign them a number, and then you use a random number generator or a lottery system like a bingo cage. Uh, or putting numbers in a hat, something old-fashioned like that. But today, we use random number generators that can be found on the internet or in calculators or in software um, to generate members of the sample. Another type of sampling that's random is systematic sampling. And this is where you go to a crowded place or you have a uh, high-traffic website or something like that, and you select every nth individual every nth individual. What do I mean by that? I mean pick a number, pick a frequency. So let's say you want every tenth individual or something like that. So I'm standing at an airport or a mall or some busy intersection, Times Square or something like that, and every tenth person that comes by, they get put into my sample and they respond to a survey. That's systematic sampling. Uh, it's a form of random sampling, but it's not exactly the same as simple random sampling. Okay, now these two are purposeful types of sampling methods that often get confused. So I'm going to try to really clearly explain the difference here. We have stratified versus cluster. So stratified is where you start by categorizing the population according to some property. Okay, so I might split into two or more strata, like gender, maybe age range, maybe course that they're taking in school, something like that. So I divide the population based on something that's relevant. Uh, 
into groups of similar individuals. These are called strata. Then I choose a separate simple random sample in each stratum and combine these SRSs to form the sample. That's stratified. Cluster is a little bit less targeted. So here I'm non-randomly splitting people into strata. Cluster, I start by classifying the population into groups of individuals that are in natural clusters. They're located near each other. So maybe they're in the same town or maybe they're in the same classroom at that time. These are called clusters. They're not grouping based on a property that the individuals have. They're simply grouped on the property that they're together already naturally. Then I choose a simple random sample of the clusters, and all individuals in the entire cluster are chosen. So I take the population, and I don't split it, but I view it as different clusters. So maybe these are zip codes or something. I want to study residents of New York, and I look at all the different zip codes or counties or something like that, and I randomly select this cluster and this cluster, and all individuals in those clusters become my sample, all right? Whereas here, I might choose 10 from each strat out of a larger number, okay? So maybe this is Democrat, Republican, and undecided or independent, right? And I want to select equal representation from each strata. So I would select a sample from each strata. Here I'm selecting entire clusters, all right? So that's the difference between stratified and cluster. Thank you so much for watching this video and spending some time learning statistics with me. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Subscribe to my channel so that I can continue making great quality content for you and that you can continue your journey through learning mathematics. This is all wonderful stuff and it's a great time to be a student. As always, I'm Dr. Kennedy. May the math be with you.